Thank you very much. Uh, let's see. Thank you very much. Seth. Can you hear that? Um, I, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm using PowerPoint because that's sort of become de rigueur in, 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 the, in, in the academy. I must say also, uh, this year for the first time I had a very sizable group of Chinese students in my classes and that's now the future of American uh, education. Um, the, uh, of course, Walmart, is, I want to make one thing clear, Walmart is the world's largest retailer. I'm going to give a kind of little, his, little historical account of it, which will explain how the, the DNA, the, the essence of this company, uh, it, it, it's translated into its supply chain and then translated into the way it, it, it sources uh, goods and produces them in China. Um, but I, I, I do think at this stage of the game, while Walmart is the biggest and in some ways the pioneer, really all of the big, big American brands and retailers are, are really doing this, much the same thing. The, the distinction is not that great. I say it's the biggest retailer, but also manufacturer, because although Walmart owns no factories, in fact, it controls them. And that is the key, that's one of the key things to understanding modern supply chains. It controls them, de facto. Uh, headquartered in Bentonville in uh, northwest Arkansas, uh, and it has a direct line to the, to the, to the workshops and, and sweatshops of Asia. Um, this is, uh, yeah, again, I don't want to be too school marmish here. Uh, you, you have your list. I'm not going to, you, you, no test on this, so don't, don't, don't think you have to know this. But I do want to highlight a couple things. Uh, uh, obviously, Walmart's success is not just the brilliance of uh, Sam Walton, although he's very smart and very, very clever. Uh, but it was a confluence of things in post-war America that, that made it possible for these kind of retail uh, chains to become gigantic, powerful, and really dominate uh, parts of the economy. The rural South is transformed, transformed physically, but actually ideologically and politically and culturally, in some ways it wasn't. Uh, Walmart comes out of Northwest Arkansas. The New Deal bypassed. There was no New Deal in Northwest Arkansas except for a couple dams. Uh, everything else was, was not. Uh, the Civil Rights Movement, you know, didn't really happen. Uh, the, uh, Northwest Arkansas was all white. Uh, the feminist impulse, very slow in arriving there. So when it, when it, it had, in a way, uh, it was creating with modern infrastructure uh, a, a company in some ways in which it's the ideology and the, and the politics of it and the, and the structure of it was based on a kind of pre-New Deal world. Um, obviously, we, we, highways, uh, uh, the, the decline of the minimum wage, which took place from 1968 on till really today, but it really dropped in the 1980s, which was precisely the time when Walmart was growing very rapidly. So in effect, Sam Walton got a, got a huge dividend from the failure to raise the minimum wage. He just, you know, uh, he pocketed the difference. Um, uh, of course, it was anti-union. Uh, fair trade laws, which had um, been uh, developed, uh, put in effect in the early 20th century to protect small business, um, they were either violated or repealed in the post-war period, and Sam Walton and his uh, took advantage of that. Let me just go on, and I'll, so here the, the cotton, we have a tremendous surplus of labor as a result of the mechanization of the South. Uh, the highways allow you to move trucks all over the place. Real minimum wage declines, you're familiar with that. Um, the government does not really support retail. It's a complicated, but retail organizing is not supported in the same way that manufacturing organizing was uh, for the union movement. Uh, the, uh, we, retail workers only came under the, the minimum wage in 1961. And I would say that one point is that Sam Walton always resented whatever was coming out of Washington. And a kind of illegality, a kind of outlaw mentality uh, was he, he, he developed. Uh, if it's a law from Washington, I'm going to violate it unless I'm forced to, to obey it. And that was true for certain minimum wage laws. This I want to emphasize, um, which we're totally familiar with today. It was developed by a committee of grocery store executives and techies in order what they thought was to fight the predecessor of the UFCW, oh, we don't need so many clerks, we'll just have these barcodes and, and, you know, and we'll save money on, on labor. That happened a little bit, uh, but not as much as they wanted. What it really did, the, what it really transformed was it meant that the retailer now knew exactly what was being sold at 
his or her store, and that would all go into their database. Whereas before, it was the the uh, the uh, manufacturer or the manufacturer's rep or the middleman who would say, "Oh yeah, we know you have you know 5,000 cases of Coca-Cola. We did deliver them last week." But now the the retailer would say, "Why? Well, we know exactly how many cases of Coke we have, and we know exactly how much uh, how much was sold." And so the bar barcode gave that information. Information is power, and that gave power to the retailer over the manufacturer. And that's one of the key elements of the supply chains that dominate the world today. Another one was, and this was a, this was a bit of genius, on, I think, on, on part of Sam Walton. Um, warehouses, they've existed since ancient Egypt, right, to store the wheat. Well, you know, you know, warehouses are extremely wasteful if you just stick the goods there and wait around a couple years or a year or six months or whatever it is, to, and then take them off the shelves and sell them. Walton understood that what was what would create a, a quantum leap in efficiency was, would be if you if the goods never rested. If you know you have a distribution center, the trucks come in one side, a few hours later they go out the other side to all the stores, and that's exactly what we have now with these massive distribution centers uh, surrounding all the great ports, as well as uh, the 120 that Walmart has built um, around the country. They're, they're big. They're big. <laughs> they need to be organized, but they're big. So Walmart uh, starts in the rural south. This is uh, actually that's after it's been going for quite a while, and it gets bigger. This used to be called the measles map. <laughs> the measles map. Uh, they stopped. Anyway, so it, it, and it, got, even, it got bigger. OK. <clears throat> so China. Um, uh, one of the keys that, that Walton understood, and, and then other retailers too, was let's you know buy a lot in bulk and sell it cheap, a lot of turnover. And he also knew, and he, and this developed in the, you know, in the U.S., let's, if we're buying a lot and we know how much you know, is we're selling. We have the information and we have the pricing power, you know, the, the, the buying power. Let's squeeze the suppliers. And he began to do that way back, back in the 70s. He just began to squeeze them, uh, eliminating the middleman. He couldn't stand the middleman. You know, I, he did not like the slogan, let's get, I can get it for you wholesale. That, you know, like some, he wanted to, you know, always have wholesale. So that was a smart, I mean, it was smart. And he, and, and, and so by the early night, late 70s, early 80s, he was selling a lot of stuff, and he would send his people to the Far East, uh, first to Hong Kong, and they'd take a sample, and they'd say, can you produce, you know, 10,000 dozen of these at this price? Uh, and, you know, and he would, and, and then, then if, they, if they, they, people did do it, then the next year they'd say, okay, we'll take another 10,000, but at, at a price slightly lower. You know, and he was just, it was just a, a, a methodical and a, a, a squeezing. Walmart never had sales never had sales, everyday low prices. That was the idea. Kmart, who's heard of blue, ra blue, blue plate specials? Yeah, that is a tribute to the failure of Kmart to, to price effectively, uh, you, know, a, a, you know, every day. They, they left it up to the manager to get rid of the extra stock. That was what the blue plate special was all about. Okay, um, in the 80s, uh, there, was a, there was the first panic over, over you know, uh, 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 selling abroad. How much time do I have left? Okay. Uh, there was a first panic. Um, the ILG, um, you know, the union. Let's how can we sing the union label song? You know. Okay. Uh, I I have it in my head here. Um, so buy American became a big thing, but but Walmart w was extremely clever on this. They got in touch with Bill Clinton, governor of Arkansas at that point. Uh, they said, okay, we're going to try to buy stuff in the United States. Uh, and will give big contracts to local Arkansas suppliers. And Clinton was happy about that, of course. And they, they, they began to do that in, 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 the, in the South. But the proviso was, you've got to beat the China price. And, and, and those days, it was more the Taiwan price or the South Korea price. But you've got to beat that price, which meant no unions, uh, no product development yourself, uh, no advertising. In effect, uh, you, the, the, manuf the, the, the manufacturers became creatures entirely of Walmart. And, and in my book, I have a story of Ferris Fashion, a small uh, manufacturing firm in Arkansas, with, which Bill Clinton was very proud of. And they got a big order from Walmart. Uh, and they made money at first. But you know, within a couple years, they, they realized they were wholly owned subsidiaries of Walmart, except for the fact that, they, that no, no stock had actually changed, changed hands. 
And when Walmart decided to pull the contract later on, they just collapsed. They just collapsed. Um, so Arkansas today is full of derelict factories, which were once booming, and then Walmart pulled the, pulled the, pulled the plug. Um, so in the Buy American Road to China, uh, Sam Walton began to send his people into the factories to work on the efficiency, uh, to maintain the, the, you know, to, to really tell the ma factory managers how to do it. Uh, they were the only buyer of the product. And so, you know, and again, Ma Walmart owns no factories, but in fact, it's a manufacturer. Now, Tiananmen Square comes along in 89. E even, even when it was trying to source from Arkansas, it was still buying a lot from China. But Tiananmen Square, Square comes along, and uh, Sam Walton was smart enough to understand, hey, this is not, we don't want to be seen as a Chinese manufacturer here with, with this. So he set up a agency called the uh, Pacific Resources Export Limited, which existed all during the 1990s, and he put his best friend in charge of it. His best friend didn't know anything about retail, but that wasn't the point. The point was to protect Walmart from the bad publicity that might come from buying stuff in China. Um, and, and, it, and, and by the end of the 1990s, uh, Prell was the biggest buying agency in the world. They had like uh, you know, 150 uh, uh, kind of little uh, uh, branches all over the Far East and about a thousand people. Um, later, as soon as China joined the WTO in 2001, okay, no problem, Tiananmen Square, not an issue anymore, that's gone. Uh, we can then absorb this independent buying agency entirely into the Walmart structure, which they did, and you know, then it became very clear that the supply chain was Walmart's. Here's a picture. This ship yeah, it has engines in the back, right? But it's being pulled, not pushed. And that's a metaphor. By that I mean, it's not as if some Chinese manufacturer said, oh, I'm gonna manufacture a, 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 the better mousetrap or the better whatever, and, try, and then I'll sell it to Walmart. The, no, no. Walmart and every other American retailer has its buying headquarters. Walmart's is in Shenzhen. Target's got one next door. They go to China and they go, sometimes the Canton Trade Fair, and they say, here, Here's what we want you to make. We want you know, 5,000 dozen of these by, you know, by three months from now, and you, know, you fulfill that contract. They, they, they place the contracts. They are the ones who do the, you know, the, the real key work on it. So these ships are, the metaphor is they are pulled from China, not pushed. And I think that's a metaphor to hold in your head. Um, trade, of course, is going up very rapidly in this period. Um, so, uh, there, this is a summary. Bentonville produces the ideas. Uh, in Shen, Shenzhen, they, they find the maker of the, the maker of it, either through a trade fair or they send their own people out. They, Walmart has employs lots of very smart Chinese buyers who know the scene very well. Um, the Chinese manufacturer, of course, makes it, but the but a Chinese manufacturer knows that to f fulfill a Walmart order, which is so gigantic. If they would actually have the stuff in their warehouse, you know, ready to do it, uh, it, it would be a waste of money. So every, so any manufacturer in China that gets an order from Walmart, instantly they have to subcontract. They can, they can't, uh, they could, they couldn't do it otherwise. You couldn't have all that, those people and goods sitting there ready to fulfill the, the order. They have to subcontract. Well, they subcontract and subcontract, and that means that even Walmart does not know. The, uh, uh, in fact, who's producing the goods. And you're on all the scandals that are coming out of China are often with, the, well, they're with all sorts of la layers of the, of the supply chain, but they're often the subcontractors. And it means also uh, that the corporate social responsibility, uh, which all the firms have, and Walmart as well, uh, uh, you know, codes of conduct, uh, these apply to the prime contractors imperfectly, but they often never apply to the subcontractors or the subcontractors. So, Corporate social responsibility, despite a, a lot of people, you know, and, uh, and now there's a whole s cottage industry of academics and it worked on it. Yeah, I just think it's fatally flawed. Um, <clears throat> okay, um, okay, and of course, you know, prices, labor, and quality are squeezed at every stage. Walmart kind of admits, they, they kind of admit in their environmental um, uh, work, which they're very proud of, in which they, they insist that the carbon footprint of the supplier be less every, every time. They kind of admit, in effect, that they control the supply chain. Of course, they don't do that when it comes to labor conditions and working conditions, but they do in everything else. Okay, here, the, I just, these are the, the pathologies of the supply chain. Um, uh, 
Yes, thank you. One minute. Okay, that's right. Okay. Um, uh, this is pretty clear, and, and others will talk about this. Let me just, I'm not going to talk about this. I can't talk about this. What I'm saying is, I think, here's my historical, this is, this is your, this is, this is not good pedagogically. I know the teachers in the, in the audience are going to say, oh, Lichtenstein, you're a terrible teacher, got too much, too much information. But I do make the, I'm, as a historian, I make the point that today we have a new era of merchant capital just as we had before the Civil War. Before the Civil War, the merchants of New York and Liverpool were in a, cons in a, in a cahoots, in a conspiracy, in a, in a brotherly uh, embrace with the slaveocracy of, uh, of the American South. Uh, New York practically seceded from the US as a result of that. Uh, because merchants don't care about the labor conditions under which products are produced, commodities. For 100 years, we had industrial capitalism, and now we've returned to a new era of, of retail, merchant, of merchant capitalism. Uh, that first era of merchant capitalism before the Civil War was ended by the bloodiest war America ever had, and I think we need to win it again. <laughs>